So yeah, um, thanks for the introduction. I am a developer relations engineer at the Firebase team, and I'm going to talk about what, how Firebase can help you build apps for other platforms. And this is my Twitter. If you want to follow me and talk about like any of the things that I'm going to cover today, or honestly anything iOS or um, any Firebase product related. So let's start because I have a, a lot of things that I want to talk today. So first, uh, I'm going to talk about the architecture of an app, the app that I'm going to use uh, today to show uh, some Firebase products. Um, then, what is Firebase and how you can configure this for your uh, Apple platform applications and how it fits into the Swift UI lifecycle. So, I'm going to cover uh, some Firebase products like Firestore, Authentication and a little bit of cloud storage and how you can use those on a widget. And last but not least, just a quick overview of how we can use Combine and Async Wave in some uh, Firebase libraries. So let's start with architecture. Every year at Google, we do this one book a week challenge, which is basically during 10 uh, weeks in a row, we, that we should read uh, one entire book. Of course, it's more challenging if you pick big books. I usually pick the thin ones. Um, <laughs> but anyways, a colleague of mine, uh, Peter Fries, who is also a developer relations at Firebase, um, who I think some of you might know, uh, he developed uh, an application that helps us keep track of the books that we are reading, the books that we already read, and the ones that we still want to, um, to read. And this is how it looked like. You can use it in uh, Mac OS and uh, iOS. And basically, it has a drop-down navigation. So if you, uh, we are looking at bigger screens like iPad and Mac, uh, we have this three-column layout where you can, we can see first the different libraries, like the, the books that we want to read, the read and the current reading. And we have the second uh, column right there, which contains the list of books on each one of the libraries. And the third column should uh, explain the book details of the book you click on. And um, we want to make sure that we have only a single source of truth. So if at some point we added the details of one book, uh, it will be reflected in all of the columns. And this is how uh, the UI is always in sync. So you can see here um, that I am typing something, like changing the, the title, and right behind the edit screen, everything is being changed automatically in the other columns too. So one more time, if we open the book and change it again, you can see it changing on the background. Okay, so how does the architecture work for this application? We have a single source of truth, which is basically an array of books, and books is a struct that we have uh, pasted on the code that only has like the basic information and details of the book. Then we have the bookshelf fill, which is where we keep uh, the list of books. We have the book row view, which is uh, every single book in the list. Then if we click on that, we have the book details view. And then um, at, uh, the last thing that you can do is click on the edit button and show the book edit view, which is where you would change the title. So the first challenge that we have is this needs to be a binding in order for us to have like it in all columns and being updated as soon as we change it. But this is not a list of bindings. This is just a usual array. So the so solution for that is to make it a binary. So we just add a dollar sign. Uh, it is, seems to be a little simple. It is actually a little, a little simple, but it's very powerful. And this is just a small example of how you can uh, deal with uh, Swift UI list bindings. But uh, Peter, the person who created this app, has this uh, personal blog. And well, the link's kind of hidden by the screen, but the QR code should work if you want to check uh, that, um, that article. It, deep types on what I show it right now because I just show like just scratch on the surface of what we can do with list bindings. So the, the challenge here is uh, what if now I don't want it to be automatically updated because as a user it's not very good user experience, right? Because like I have the added screen and then I'm editing the book and then I'm just like ah nah, I just decided that I don't want to do this anymore. But then I cancel it and then all the other screens are already updated. So how would we do that? So, the solution that Peter decided to use here is, um, so we have the binding of the book in the edit view, but 
In the init block, uh, we're going to create a view model and pass uh, the rapid value of the book inside. And then all the changes are that the view model does is going to be in this rapid value. And then this is the value that we're going to use in the text field, that's the text field that you are adding to the title. And we are only going to commit the change to the book binding once the user clicks on the button to save and recall this function right here. So this is what happens if we use this new uh, architecture. So you can see I'm adding a lot of question marks, but nothing changes in the other three columns. Two columns. Here. But then once I commit to this change, it actually changes. And now an example um, of adding stuff that I actually don't want to be reflected. And then I cancel and nothing happens on the other side. And this is how the view model will look like. So on the init block, we are going to uh, get the book that was passed uh, from the other screen, and we are going to assign to the published book. And we can also operate some extra validation, like in this case, I'm just validating the ISBN of the book. And here is Peter Chen on YouTube, where he uh, has a series of building structural UI components, and he also deep dives on, on many more things than what I just covered right now. Okay, that covers uh, the architecture for this uh, application. So Firebase, um, before I jump into Firebase, how many of you already know or have used Firebase at some point? Nice. <laughs> like that always surprises me. Um, okay, so Firebase, for those of you who still um, haven't tried it, is basically um, many things. But we offer many products for the different parts of developing an application. So when you are building your application, you are probably going to need uh, uh, help in some steps. Like for example, you want to add authentication, but you don't want to like build the whole backend to do the authentication. Same thing for a database or storing things in the cloud, like large files. Then Firebase has some products, those products right there, that help you do that. Then after you build your app and you release it, you want to keep track of um, how it is um, being used by the users. So if there's any errors happening, if there are screens being frozen, all this kind of performance problems, you want to be aware of that in order to keep your app quality. So these are the products that Firebase offers to help you with that. And at least once you release your app and you are sure that, you, um, uh, that it has quality, the quality that you want it to, um, you are ready to engage your users, so you want to keep the current users engaged, but you also want to grow it and uh, find another users. So this is the products that Firebase uh, offers to help you with that. And if you go to the Firebase console, this is what the dashboard will look like once you log in. Uh, you can view your, all your current projects or you can create new Firebase projects. So uh, before I jump into how to configure the Firebase project for uh, Apple platforms, I want to talk about what a project is. So a project is the place where you will configure all the Firebase services for the applications that you want. So for example, let's say you have an application that runs on both uh, iOS, Android, and web. So um, you, inside of that project, everything that you configure, the databases, the authentications, um, the remote configurations, everything is going to be applied to all apps registered under that project. So if your apps uh, need the same user base, database, uh, this kind of stuff, you should put them inside the same project. And the project that uh, we created was Bookshelf, and inside of it, we're going to register your iOS app. So the only mandatory information that you need in order to register an iOS app under a Firebase project is the iOS bundle ID. Of course, you can also have the App Store ID and the nickname, which will help you easily identify this app into the console. But uh, mainly, you just, uh, if you want to, you just can add the iOS bundle ID and create the project. Next thing, you need to download the Google service playlist file and put that on your project. And here, uh, there's a very big careful um, sign of, don't forget to add this to all your targets. So the bookshelf app works for both Mac, Mac OS, and iOS, so we need to add this uh, file to all the targets. Next thing, um, we can use Super Packet Manager, which is available from version 8 of Firebase SDK, to look for the Firebase iOS SDK and then look up all the libraries that we have there, and then we can install them using Super Package Manager. 
Once everything is installed, the next step is we need to initialize Firebase. But uh, you might notice that here the console is telling you to do this on AppDelegate. What happens if we don't have an AppDelegate? So let's see how that happens with SwiftUI application lifecycle. So this is what you see once you create a project uh, in SwiftUI. This right here is, that, is how you tell it's the entry point of your app. And then in order to, con to configure Firebase, we can use the init block and just run the Firebase app.configure as the console tells you to. But it will work for most of the Firebase libraries, not for all of them. Like Firebase called Messaging, who sends push messages to your app, uh, requires app delegate in order to work. So how do we do that? Uh, we can have a UI application delegate adapter. And basically, we are going to um, create an app delegate, initialize Firebase, uh, just now it's just how we see on the console. And then we're going to use this UI application delegate adapter inside our uh, bookshelf app to initialize it. Yes, another block. So here's the usemate guide to the SwiftUI application lifecycle, also written by Peter, and it's a very uh, nice one to that deep dive into it. Okay, now we are all set to actually start using Firebase products. So the first product that I would like to talk about is Firestore. So um, Firestore you know, is our solution to store uh, information in the cloud. And you might be wondering why would I want to store my information, like users' information in the cloud. So first reason why you might want to do that is that so that the user is able to share uh, whatever. Uh, they want to share with other people, with other accounts, and also with other devices. So it might be their own account in other devices. So let's say we are using the bookshelf application, we're just, I don't know, maybe going to work using the underground. Sorry from London, I'm not sure what it's called here. But uh, I finished reading a book and then I mark it as complete, like I change it from the current reading to the red library uh, on my cell phone, and then when I get to work, I want to open my Mac and I want to see it updated there, right? So, um, storing things in the cloud is the easiest way to like code share this with other users or with your account that you're using in other devices. Wow, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Firebase uh, offers a lot of features. Uh, one of uh, the features is effortless syncing. So, what happens is you can configure your application to listen to any of the Firebase collections. And as soon as the documents change it in any of the, in the collection that you are listening to, um, you are going to get this update instantly. So it's very easy to sync between all the devices. We also offer offline mode. So uh, let's say you are on a plane, but you still uh, want to read and edit your documents. Uh, once you go online again, all these changes are going to be synced. And if you don't feel like setting up listeners, we can uh, we have uh, one-time patches, so you can just uh, send a query to Firestore. Uh, who has exactly what you want? Like I want uh, this document, passing this document ID, and you do a one-time patch, and you get these documents. I'm talking about documents and collections without explaining what this is. So this is a doc. This is what basically a document looks like. You might notice it's very close to what a JSON would look like. Basically, it's pairs of keys and values, and the values can be almost anything. So they can be strings, numbers, uh, booleans, binary data. But uh, careful to not store uh, very big things here because we have uh, um, like a max uh, amount of like the size of data that you that a document can have, and it's one megabyte if I'm not wrong. And then all these documents are stored into collections in Firestore. So you have documents information, and each document can have a subcollection of documents inside of it. And then the subcollection we have another document, and it goes on and on. This is how it looks uh, if you open the console. You're going to have the top level, top level collections, which for the bookshelf application. Uh, it's kind of shaking. Okay, so. But uh, this top level, the top level collections for this application are the shelves and the books. So the collection of books uh, holds all the books inside of that collection. And then if you click on one of them, you can see the document itself, which is uh, this right here. And this document is what uh, the strict book looks like in our application. So for each uh, field that we have in our strict, for uh, 
each one of those informations, we have a field on the document, except the ID. The ID is not a field in the document, but it's the ID of the document itself, because we need this ID in order to fetch a single document, in order to update this document or delete this document. Um, so this is how you would fetch a single document, let's say you are in the uh, book field, uh, and then you click on to see the details of a book, we would fetch the single book. So the way we do this, uh, we call Firestore Collection, saying that the collection that I want to listen to, to fetch right now is the book's collection, and then I'll get the document based on the document ID, which is the ID of the book. It will return a reference, and uh, with this reference, I can actually download the document. And once uh, the, doc the result arrives, I can map all the fields uh, from the document to real fields in my book. But this isn't very good, right? It's like a lot of code to mapping fields right there. So can we do better? We can. So this is how it looks right now. This is how we can do it. So maybe, uh, maybe, sorry, so we are uh, actually able to um, use uh, Codable to do all the mapping. So you just get the document that you just downloaded and you say dot data as and you pass the strip that you want this data to be in and then Codable does all the, the work for you. But in order to do that, uh, when you are using Swift Package Manager to import the Firebase iOS SDK, you have to import the Firestore and Firestore Swift package because Codable is only available in Swift. But the good thing is you can use it and it works very nicely. So this is how I show you the architecture. And now let's add Firestore to this architecture. So Firestore now is now the single source of truth. Uh, for our, our books. So, how do we fetch a collection of books in order to show the list? So we have this published uh, books, which is basically an array of books, and we are going to get the collection of books, and instead of fetching uh, one document per time, we are going to add a snapshot listener to our application. So, whenever there is an update in this collection, it will uh, fire this closure, and then I can get all the documents that are now in my collection. I can map them using Codable, which just takes one line to do it. And then once I map it, I put it inside the books array, and then give me some data. So this is how it would look like after we've done it. So let's change the book name to the console itself. I we try this to just sign everything together. Once you click to update, it updates in the app. It's very fast. Then let's just <coughs> let the title correct again. And it works both ways. So if you add something using your device, the collection will be updated just as fast. So here we are adding this book to our application. And if we go back to the console, the books now display it into our first store instance. Let's add an excellent exclamation point to the title. And it's there. So um, the books struct has very simple uh, information, it's basically strings, um, but there are all type of data that you can store into a Firebase a Firestore document, right? And, well, in order to learn how to do this mapping of different types of data, Peter did this uh, article, it's a big one, it is 11 minutes read, but it contains how you would map like different types of data um, using uh, Codable, and it's about to become an official part of the official documentation, but while it's not there, uh, if you're curious about knowing how to map for every type of data, uh, this article helps you do that. Okay, so now we cover Firestore, and uh, before jumping to authentication, I would like to talk about driving user engagement. So there are many ways that a user can uh, open your application. The most common is, of course, like uh, app, uh, tapping on the app icon on your device and then open it. But you can also open it uh, using notifications or share extensions and widgets. So let's check what Firebase uh, offers to help you doing these things. 
to send notifications, we have a product called uh, Firebase Cloud Messaging, uh, better known as FCM. <coughs> and it has a nice uh, option to send visual notifications like this one. And we just learned this morning that animations are very important if you have a proposal to do those, right? So um, Firebase helps you do that. And uh, it's also available in March or less. And here is not, um, I promise, is, I'm not going to show like, many, many more articles, but this one is really interesting because it teaches you how to actually send notifications with vi nice visuals to stand out uh, for the users. So you can add GIFs, you can have images. It's a very nice one to check. And it's available in the Firebase official blog. So um, if you cannot take the, the care code right now, it's just firebase.blog. Okay, so in order to show what we offer for WebGAS, uh, let's use this application as an example. It's just a basic application called the Mini Travel Blog, where you can uh, share pictures with your friends who have this app installed, and they can see pictures from your travel uh, into their WebGAS. So how would we do this using Firebase products? We would first upload the image to the Firebase Cloud Storage, which is the product that we offer to store large files. And then we are going to have a struct called post that has both the URL for the image and uh, the description of that image, and then we upload this to Firestore. Let's see how that works. So inside Share View Controller, we are going to start a task uh, so we are able to use the Firebase APIs that have support for async await. And then we run this put data async, which uploads the image to, to cloud storage. Then you can download the URL from this uploaded image and add the URL and the description to a post and then add it to the post collection into Firestore. And the last thing is tell the widget center to reload the timelines. Okay, so after we do that, uh, what we can do in the iOS app is download the image, then download the post from Firestore and then display the image with the description. The same thing is what we're going to do to widgets. We just download the image, we download the post from Firestore, and we display them. So let's take a look uh, on the widget, which is the like, what I, we want to cover today. So inside the get timeline, which is uh, where you provide the array of timeline entries for the widget, uh, the first thing that you do is to check if the Firebase app is already initialized or the wire is being initialized here. Um, once again, you start the task, and then uh, this post repository, we are going to take a look at that in a moment, but it's a struct that we created uh, to call the Firebase APIs, and it's basically going to return the image and the text, and with the image and the text, we create a simple entry, and with uh, uh, an array of uh, this entry over here, we create a timeline. This is the post repository I was just talking about. So first, let's import all the Firebase libraries that we need for this one. Uh, then we are going to download the image and the document from uh, Firestore. And then we are going to uh, create a post and return, uh, return both the image and the post description to the get timeline function we just saw. That covers Wicked. So now let's talk about my, my personal favorite product, authentication. So many times you, you want to authenticate your user because you want to protect the data that they're putting into your application and you can do it in many ways. So Firebase authentication offers you a uh, fastest way to do it if, like if compared to building the whole backend to do so. And we offer different types of authentication methods so you can authenticate your user with um, uh, cell phone number, with email and password, and with authentication providers like these ones in this image. So how would you do that? First, you would sign in your user, then you would update your data model to be linked to this user, so each user can see only the data that they uploaded, that, uh, that they uploaded to the first store and that belongs to them, and then uh, you can secure user's data. That's a very, very important part that I'm going to cover in a minute. And we have a feature called anonymous authentication. 
which is very nice and I can say that from a very personal point of view because for me the best thing about anonymous authentication is that it provides a great user experience so imagine you just download an application and you want to try to use it to see if you feel like it or not but before you're being able to use it you need to give all your details create an account, sign in, sign up and well we all know how, how we don't want the user to do that so anonymous authentication is a way to provide um, a user credential uh, that will securely store all the user's document without actually asking them to create an account. And that's very important because, uh, well, we've talked about it a few times today already, user experience is like very, very, very important for an application because if the user does not like our application, there is a high probability that there's another app out there doing basically the same thing or something very similar and they're just going to try um, another thing. And the reason why I say this is very personal to me is because it happened to me. So uh, let me hit the pause into this, uh, this uh, presentation to just talk to you about, um, I recently uh, decided to adopt a cat. So um, I looked for like all shelters in London in order to do that. And I decided I wanted to adopt from the closest one to my house uh, because I didn't want to put the cat through the whole stressful process of like getting to car and blah, blah. So what I did, I went to that shelter website to see the cats that they had. Guess what? I needed to like give all my personal information, create an account, just to see the cats list. It was like, what? So what I did, I went to the second uh, closest shelter to my house and I adopted the cat there. True story. It's the cat. It's Phoebe. So, um, I guess I made my point on how much anonymous authentication can help you retain your users. And it's very simple to use. So you basically call the uh, alt library and you say sign in anonymously. And that's it. Next time you run alt.current user, the current user that's going to be returned is that anonymous user with a credential that you can use to store documents and protect them. But then, after the user is, uh, has already used your application, he might want to create an account. You might need to ask him for that. Like, of course, after I decided on the cat that I wanted to adopt, I actually had to create an account with the shelter and provide my information uh, in order to adopt the cat. So um, let's check how you would allow the user to sign in with Apple. So uh, we are not going to cover the part of the own request, but let's say the user just uh, added his password or his facial identification and granted access to the account. And now you have the result. So what you're going to do is get the uh, token, the I, Apple from Apple ID credential, turn it to a string, and then uh, send it and the uh, provider ID, which is Apple, uh, to Firebase SDK overall provider dot credential, and it will ret return you a valid credential that you can use to sign in on this app from now on. So what you do once you have this credential, you just do all about signing and you sign it into your Firebase. Okay, so now we need to update our model to make each one of these loops right here uh, to belong to one specific user. Because right now, uh, until now, we didn't have anything to identify. But now, we do. We have the user ID because the user just signed in. So what we do is, instead of calling DB collection, uh, dot snapshot listener, before the adding the snapshot listener, we are going to add this where field and we are going to say user ID is equal to that uh, book user ID, to that document user ID. And this way we are just going to listen to changes on documents that belong to that user. And now the most important part that I wanted to cover about authentication in Firestore, the security rules. So security rules is something that you have when you go into your Firebase project and open your Firestore or cloud storage. And you can edit this rule to make sure that only the right person, the right people will have access to your data. So this is just an example of how you could uh, write this security rules for this application. So we are allowing any, any user with a valid credential to create books in there. But in order to read, update, and delete, it's not enough to only have signed in. You have to also uh, have the, your user ID needs to be the same as the document you were trying to either update, read, or delete. 
And once you publish the secure rules, so it's not something that you uh, call the next code, you do that in the console itself, and then you click publish, and once you keep, click publish, all the Firebase, uh, all the calls to the Firestore API will conform to these rules. Okay, um, now uh, we covered almost everything. I uh, just want to give a quick glance of how we can use Combine and async await on the APIs that I just talked about today. So, Combine. Uh, here we have the sign in anonymously method that I, uh, you were checking before. And this might be new because the, most of the Firebase APIs has synchronous methods. So the result uh, won't arrive right, right after. Like we are not sure when exactly it's going to arrive. So this line here might be new and it's not a very uh, good thing to do. So the solution to that would be having a callback and then uh, waiting once this, results arri once this result arrives. Um, we can operate on it and we can do even better with combine so we sign in anonymously and then we use combine to assign this to a publisher user and combine uh, was added uh, the support for combine was added in firebase uh, 8.9.0 so if you happen to be using firebase and you still don't have access to that make sure to update to the latest version because we are constantly um, updating the SDKs uh, based on the developer's needs. And async await. So, I guess at some point of our lives we have all uh, faced the callback program of Doom. So, uh, it's kind of really hard to read, but basically what's happening here is uh, I am trying to, uh, I have an extension called Article Anal Analyzer, and I'm trying to first fetch an article, then I check the result to see if it's a success or a failure. If it's a, su a success, I try to extract the title, and it goes on to extract the, the text and then the image, and well, it can go on forever, right? So the solution to make it better would be using a sync await because that's how you would do it, uh, using a sync await. You just uh, use the syntax which is try await and then you call the fetch article and you are going to have this result into the HTML text and you can use HTML text in the next calls. So what I like about it is that it makes you write a synchronous code uh, in kind of a synchronous way, meaning that it's, like, it's easy to read. Because you, you look at that and this is how you would, for example, read a book. It's something that our brain is used to doing, so it makes sense when you read it. So, uh, same method, signing in one, anonymously. We can have the callback, which works, it's fine. But we can also do it with async away, which would look something like this. Just uh, calling try await and then signing in, getting the results, and then we can operate in this result right below. So, um, this is another uh, series from both uh, Peter Blog and Peter's YouTube channel that tells you how to um, use async await in Swift UI. In this video right here, which you can uh, get from the QR code or just type Peter Freeze on YouTube. It teaches you how to use async await in uh, all the Firebase APIs, not only authentication, because we have support for async await in all the APIs as well. That covers basically everything that I wanted to cover today. So thank you so much. And if you are curious about the application that I uh, showed you, uh, it's available under Peter's repository. And that's it. If you want to like, talk to me about any of those things or any uh, thing Firebase related or MS related, I'll be wearing this. It's very hard not to see yellow t-shirt, so it's easy to spot me today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so.